Yep. Now Take it away, Robin. Cool. Well, hello, everyone. Again, thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, let's see. There we go. So this is me, since usually I would start off talking a little bit and waving and saying hi, but not tonight, unfortunately. But I am here today to talk to you about my absolute favorite thing in the world, which is the human skeleton. Now, I actually started my training as an archaeologist, and I'm currently working as one now, as Natalie said. And I started in archaeology because I loved learning about what, how people lived in the past, what they ate, how they lived and cared for themselves, what people did every day. And I know that's what drew me into this field. And to me, artifacts are a key part of this. They're the outputs of behavior, the tools we make and the structures we create. All of these things reflect our culture and behavior. But one thing that drew me into biological anthropology and into the study of skeletons is that those very same behaviors that we study as archaeologists also leave their traces in our very bones. Now, I started studying skeletons for a very simple reason, and that is I think they're incredibly cool. And the pinnacle of science reporting, the onion, backs me up on this. Um, the reason I find bones so fascinating is that we often don't think of them as being alive. We tend to think of our, about our bones as a static tissue. It's a solid framework that supports our muscles and protects our organs. But bones are a living dynamic tissue exactly like the rest of our bodies. Even after you stop growing and your skeleton hits its final height, you're constantly fixing damage, maintaining your body against wear and adapting to the changing forces of everyday life. And most importantly to us as archaeologists, unlike other dynamic tissues like our muscle and our body fat, skeletons have enough inorganic material that they preserve. And to me, that means they're an ideal place to ask those really detailed questions, not just about what society did as a whole, but how that affects an individual's experience. And so to me, that's just absolutely wonderful. So what can we learn from skeletal analysis? Now, if you've ever done any forensic anthropology or just like me watched a lot of the TV show Bones, you've probably heard about something called the biological profile. So this is estimating an individual's basic characteristics like sex and age and height and weight, and sometimes even broad information on their ancestral background from the pelvis and the skull. And that's usually the most important basic information about a single person and what they were like, but that isn't all that we can learn from the skeleton. So I study a type of analysis called bone functional adaptation, and that likes to look at a much more broad question. What were people actually doing during their life? And this works because of something called Wolf's Law or more recently bone functional adaptation. And at its most basic, we can kind of say that Wolf's Law is this. Bone is deposited where it's needed and it's removed where it's not. And okay, how does your body know where bone is needed in the first place? And that's a really cool question to start with. To do that, we have to pay attention to two factors, stress and strain. So stress is how much force and activity puts on your bones. So think like the impact of your steps on the pavement or the weight of the barbell you're lifting. And in response to that, when we put that force on a bone, the bone bends ever so slightly. And that amount of bending is what we call strain. The interplay between stress and strain is what Wolf's Law relies on to give the body feedback about where bone is needed or where it's not needed anymore. The easiest way to think about Wolf's Law is kind of like a thermostat. Every single bone in your body has a set point, the amount of strain it can experience without signaling the body to change. Think of it like setting your thermostat to 72 degrees. It's the comfortable place. It's where you wanna be, but Say you took up jogging during the pandemic, you're going to increase the amount of stress on your bones and that's gonna change how much bending your bones experience on an everyday basis. If you're running all the time, that's a lot more strain happening on your bones. And those little tiny flexes are going to trigger your body to lay down more bone in that direction so that the increased strain is now decreased back down to that safe, happy, comfortable level. Kind of like your house gets hot, you turn on the air conditioning to make it cooler again. But let's say six weeks into your jogging habit, you roll your ankle and so you stop running. That means your bones are gonna experience a lot less stress and therefore they're bending a lot less than before. The decrease in strain stimulates your body to get rid of that extra bone that it doesn't need anymore. 
And that means that your everyday activities will then raise that strain back into that nice sweet spot in the middle. Extra bone is heavy. You don't wanna be carrying more than you need. So therefore, the bones that you have right now in your body are tailor-made to deal with the kinds of behavior that you do every single day. Now, this can be really helpful when we look at people around us to understand the forces that shape bone. And this actually brings us to a really interesting problem that's popped up in our modern life. And that's the trouble with astronauts. The most basic load that you put on your body every single day is your weight. From when you get out of bed to when you hit the gym, your body weight is shaping the strength of your bones. And in kids, weight explains up to 88% of overall bone strength. But there's a problem in space, there's no gravity. You're not putting that basic load on your bones every single day like you would on the planet Earth. It's like being on permanent bed rest. And this means that astronauts lose between one and 2% of their bone density every single month because they aren't loading their bones and they are subjected to this bone functional adaptation. That's why when you see videos of people at the International Space Station, you see them jogging on treadmills, they're trying to simulate as much of that bone impact as possible just to try to keep their bone density high enough for when they return to Earth. And even then, because there's no gravity, it only slows the loss. And this shows us how critical understanding how bone adapts is when we're thinking towards the future, things like long-term space flight. We have to figure out how we're gonna retain enough bone that when we make it to wherever we want to go, we still have skeletons that can handle gravity. This is also the reason that we think about uh, activity when we have an elderly person who's broken a hip. When we break a hip, it's actually more about breaking the neck of the femur. You can kind of see it in highlighted in red on the x-ray. You usually don't fall and break a hip. You break a hip and then fall. And that's because as people age, their bones require more stimulation to maintain that current level of bone density. This is particularly common in women because estrogen kind of makes bones a little bit more sensitive to force. And as it declines after menopause, a lot of women struggle with their bone density declining and their body is now under adapted to the forces that they encounter every day. When coupled with how many people become less active as they age, it's a really rough situation because bones are now not stronger than the peak forces they encounter. And when that happens, bones break. So that's why the first stage after hip replacement is actually to get the patient to start walking as soon as humanly possible, even if it takes a lot of painkillers to help them manage it. The worry is if you're on bed rest after hip surgery, it could actually lead to more bone loss and then therefore your other hip is more liable to break as well. So those are the downsides of bone functional adaptation. What are the upsides? The really neat part is if you're an athlete of any kind, even if you're a weekend warrior, your bones have probably adapted to your favorite hobbies. If you've started running, you or someone you know might have had issues with stress fractures or shin splints. Well, some of that is due to muscle tears. It can also be caused by tiny little micro fractures in your shin bone, your tibia. And so if you're adding exercise during to your quarantine, make sure that you ramp up your distance slowly and let your body have a chance to adapt to all of those new micro stresses so that your bones can get stronger and deal with your new exercise. The other neat thing is that we can tell a little bit about the kinds of activity you're doing based on the forces you place on your bone. Runners and soccer players have unique characteristics in their lower limbs based on the differences in their sports. When you think about running, you think about people running in a straight line in a single direction. And that's reflected in their lower limbs. Their bones are very good at handling straight line force and are really strong against bending from to back, but not so much from other directions. In contrast, we've got things like soccer players who tend to dart from side to side and are quickly making corrections to their movement. And when we look at their lower leg bones, we actually see that their bones are strong in all directions to deal with that constantly changing direction of force. Okay, maybe you're like me and you're not much of a runner. It's not my favorite thing in the planet, but other activities can change your body as well. So tennis players are a classic example of bone functional adaptation. Most of these tennis players like Serena Williams who've been playing all their life and started young have um, arms, especially their humeri, their upper arms, that are asymmetrical because of how much they use their dominant arm and how little they use their non-dominant arm. Um, 
we can see between a four and 13% difference between the dominant arm and the non-dominant arm in tennis players. Swimmers, if you're, that happens to be your favorite kind of activity, have increased bone strength, but they're symmetrical because you're using both arms in a very similar fashion. And both of these uh, sports players are stronger than non-athletes for the same kinds of upper arm bending strength. Even really non-intuitive exercises can have an impact on your body. Uh, professional sumo wrestlers show an increase in bone density of the hip after they enter professional training studios. And what's causing it isn't completely clear, but one of the ideas is that a lot of sumo training involves heavy stamping with the legs, and that can cause more force into the hip and build up bone in that area. So this happens fairly quickly uh, on the realm of three to six weeks. And this, we can use this kind of math called cross-sectional geometry to interpret these thickness patterns that we see in ancient populations and then compare them to these modern populations, these different athletes, to get an idea of what are the forces that uh, historic populations might've encountered that and maybe draw some analogies between the two. Now, let's talk about some, some really cool math questions that we can answer with cross-sectional geometry. Were Neanderthals right or left-handed? A very simple question, something that we would really love to observe, but it's kind of hard to tell just from looking at a person. But remember how those tennis players had dominant arms that were a lot stronger than their non-dominant arms? Well, Neanderthals are even more so. Uh, Neanderthal dominant arms are up to 50% stronger than their non-dominant arms. And the stronger arm is the right arm, about 76% of the time. So this is right in line with what we expect in modern humans. Neanderthals were about as right-handed as a modern human. Okay, but if they're this strong, what could they have been doing with their arms that they're stronger than people who have been playing tennis their entire lives? So the first was that it might've been caused by spear hunting. Neanderthals used pretty heavy duty spears and they were using it to get very close to large game and hunt that way. And if you're spearing a bison from five feet away, you're gonna use as much force as humanly possible so you can get out of there pretty quick. Um, so that was our first idea of, okay, maybe it has to do with muscle force there. But Studies looking at which muscles fire when you're trying to use a spear suggest that spears would have needed support from both hands, especially the non-dominant arm to provide the thrusting action. But as another hypothesis suggests, it might be a lot more mundane. Um, according to some experimental archaeology, it takes about eight hours to scrape a hide. And the same studies have suggested that hide scraping used a lot more of the muscles of one arm than the other to use that scraper over and over and over again in that very repetitive way to process a single hide. So maybe Neanderthal's strength differences have to do with a very basic activity of making really awesome warm clothes, as opposed to necessarily what we think of, which is hunting. All right, what are some other lifestyle questions we can answer using skeletons? This one is one of my absolute favorites. And that's when people start wearing shoes. Um, the study was done by Eric Trinkhaus and it's just absolutely interesting. Archeologically, the earliest evidence of shoes we have actually comes from North America and they're dated to about nine to six and a half thousand years ago. This is a picture of one of the earliest shoes in North America, it's actually from Missouri. And so that's our most concrete idea of shoes. There are some, suggest some suggestions of foot coverings in Eurasia from about 30,000 years ago, but unfortunately the leather is very degraded, so it's hard to tell like what kind of shoe we're looking at or if it was just a basic foot covering like a sock. So then the question becomes, when did shoe use become common? So this is some of the earliest thought shoes. This comes from a burial called Sungir. And you can see in the reconstructions, there's little leather boots. But were they more shoe-like with a rigid sole or were they more sock-like? What we found from looking at populations that are modern and don't tend to wear shoes at all is that uh, walking barefoot puts a lot of force on your toe bones. 
those toe phalanges get a ton of force as you push off your foot on every single step. But when you wear any sort of rigid sole, it decreases the amount of force in those toes and spreads it out over the whole forefoot, which means your toes bend a lot less. They don't get as much, uh, they don't have to be as strong to resist those forces. And when we look at a wide range of archeological populations across the middle and upper Paleolithic, there's a distinct drop in the average toe robusticity around 35,000 years ago. So we can interpret this evidence that shoes turned up about 35,000 years ago, way before our earliest concrete archeological evidence of shoes, and that they were pretty widespread at this point. So we can answer very basic questions about what you wear using your bones. Then comes a question that's actually very near and dear to my own interests, and that's how active were past populations. Now, we know that you and I today aren't nearly as active as the average person from the 1500s, but what's that difference like compared to someone from 20,000 years ago? Well, the cool thing is we have all of these modern populations, these soccer players and these runners, where we can just sit down and ask them, when did you start running? How often do you run? What are the kinds of distances that you do? And then we can look at their bones and compare them to these Paleolithic populations to find out like what kind of baseline are we looking at? And we you know what we find? Ancient humans had bones that were incredibly strong. When we compare them to our most active sample, which is college cross country runners, these uh, modern humans are running around a hundred miles a week. Ancient populations had bones that were stronger than that. So this helps back up some of our ideas from reconstructive archeology span and cultural anthropology that the size of the hunting range for your average Eurasian hunter-gatherer could be as large as 2000 square miles, which is kind of on par with what we've learned from our modern analogies. And it kind of shows us that prehistoric people were really on the move. But uh, conversely, when we get more sedentary, we also see changes in the skeleton. This is a really neat study by Bridges who looked at upper arm strength in Native Americans in Illinois over the entire period where this population adopted maize agriculture. And what we expect when we think of, oh, a new grain coming into use is that grinding tools would become more prevalent. We'd see an increase in the bending of the upper arms. But that's actually not what we see at all. It's the complete opposite. What we're seeing is that bones were actually got stronger much before the advent of maize, and then the bending strength declined slightly once maize agriculture integrated. So what do we think is going on here? It's suggested that there were actually a couple of different transitions prior to maize agriculture, and that the first crop that was intensively processed was maybe native seeds and grasses that kicked off this agricultural shift, and that explains the increased bending, of bending strength before corn shows up on the scene. Now, after all of that time, it suggests that corn might have actually been less labor intensive to process and grow since we have that little bending strength decline. And this could be due to technical changes or even just if increased efficiency at grinding or other really neat technological changes like pre-soaking corn kernels to make them easier to work with. Interestingly enough, we don't see this pat same pattern in males. Male arms become much more symmetrical and a little bit weaker in this time, probably because of the shift from the atlatl to the bow. So this tells us a little bit about prehistoric gender roles as well. We see a different trend in women than we do in men. So this is kind of an overview of the sort of literature that you can see when we start looking at cross-sectional geometry. But this is one that starts asking a really neat question about what do people eat? And this is where I actually started my work. The live body weight of prey animals can be pretty handy for a wide range of archeological questions. How much does each kind of prey make up in your diet? How rich is your environment? Is there a lot of competition? Does that mean that the soil fertility is really high? Are there seasonal variations in the sorts of animals that we see on the site? And this is where I started doing my work is being interested in these kinds of body mass changes in animals because that's something I could study the most easily. Now we can estimate how much um, 
and how much an animal's body brought to a particular amount of food. But there is a difficulty with a couple of the methods that we currently use. Um, we can use something called minimum number of individuals, where we count up the number of bones in each site, figure out about how many is the minimum number of deer that made up these bones, multiply that by the average weight and call it good. Now, there is a problem with this, is that assumes that the average weight that we have today is the average weight of all deer, all the time, everywhere. And that can be a bit of an issue. Deer body size can vary by state. So we know that there's a bit of a change there. We can also say, okay, bone makes up roughly 7% of an organism's body weight. So we scrape up all the bones together, we weigh them, we multiply it out. And here, that's how many deer we have on this site. This also has issues. Um, you can have problems with preservation and some of the bones being a little bit more leached. We can have issues as far as overall, if we find a, a bunch of a pound of fingers, that's gonna be a very different perspective than a pound of pelvis. So that doesn't work quite well either. And if we actually look at deer themselves, deer vary a lot in their average weight during just a standard year, let alone across their lifetime. Um, female deer can vary up to 30 pounds across a single year as far as putting on fat to gestate young over the winter and then that immediate weight loss when the young is then born. But luckily for us, Wolf's Law and Bone Functional Adaptation applies in other animals as well as it applies in humans. And so this is one of the applications that I've gotten to work on. Luckily at this point, I was living in Missouri and deer hunting is a big thing there. So what I did is I went out during deer hunting season and collected uh, the metapodial bones from 64 white-tailed deer. So the metapodial is this big long bone that's basically right above the hoof. And most hunters don't really care much about it because there's not a lot of meat on it and it's not necessarily good for preserving. So it's easy to get a hold of if you're a grad student. I was able to go to a very, very patient uh, meat processing plant who let me weigh all of their deer and collect some of their bones. And then I cleaned them, sectioned them, measured them and scanned them using cross-sectional geometry. So this is the kind of measurements I was looking at. In the literature, there are a couple of methods using skeletal elements to try to estimate a deer's body mass. We can look at the width of each of the bones or we can look at the area that in the articular surfaces. And so I was curious, how does something like cross-sectional geometry that's constantly changing and modifying and dealing with these massive body shifts during the year compare to the published literature? And so I did measurements like you see all the way there on the right, cut the bone in half, section it off, sketch the outside and then calculate the cross-sectional bending strength and use that to look at the mass. And luckily for me, I was able to find out that the methods that I used are a lot more tightly linked than the methods that were currently established in the literature. My methods explained a lot more of the variation in bone body strength and the articular areas, well, they did a good job, weren't nearly nice, which makes sense. I'm using a measurement that's constantly changing during an individual's life as opposed to fixed at the age of 18. As we all know, our body weight changes a little bit from teenager to current years. And my method is able to pick up on that. But when I'm not thinking about deer, I'm actually really more interested in a time period called the late Pleistocene. And that's a period about 25,000 years ago, after the evolution of the first humans, once they've developed art and a lot of the other traits that we associate with humans and leave Africa for Europe. So when we think about this time period, we think we have a very distinct mental picture of what it's like to be an early human. And we think about those highly active 100 plus mile a week runners, and there's a mental picture that comes with that. But then we also have art like this figure here, um, the Venus of Willendorf, which is part of a decent number of archeological representation of people in bigger bodies. And so this is what's known as the adipocity paradox, which is how do we have super active hunter gatherers who also manage to gain enough weight that we can make artistic interpretations of people in larger bodies. So that made me wonder what people looked like in the past. Muscle takes a lot of calories to maintain and move, but if you have too little body fat, that can also affect your ability to be active. Too little fat, you risk starvation. Too much, it 
might be very difficult to do your day-to-day -day life. So I got curious, what can we tell about body size in the Pleistocene? So despite everyone agreeing that you can estimate body mass from bones, there's actually a lot of debate on how bone strength changes as body size increases. Some literature argues that people with higher body weights move differently. Either they take shorter steps or their feet are further apart as they walk, and that can change their bone shape. Some people argue that the lack of muscle makes bones weaker. Some people argue that the increase in overall body weight makes bones stronger. Some people argue that nothing changes at all. It's impossible to tell anything. And one of the complicating factors that got me interested in this topic is that many of the higher weight people in the sample are also really inactive, meaning it's hard to tell if the changes that we're seeing are due to people sitting more or if it has to do with body mass. And so to me, this is a really cool place to study. There's a lot of different factors that could all be confounded with one another. So I decided to see what can I, can I pick this apart? Can I pick apart the influences of higher body weight, higher activity and inactivity? So I got lucky and was able to start with a documented cadaver collection at Texas State's Forensic Anthropology Center. They have donated cadavers with some personal information that were provided by the person. So I could select some individuals with a higher BMI and some individuals with a normal weight BMI. Then I did what you do to measure body strength when you can't cut the bone in half, which is I took um, basically the same putty that you bite into at the dentist's office and wrapped it around the outside of the bone to make a cast. Then I took an x-ray like you see here and measured the bone thickness at certain parts, plug it into a computer program and it sends me all of the bone cross sections just like if I was able to cut it in half. This method works really well for bones that can't be damaged, but uh, it did lead to a really awkward customer service call from a dental supply store who wanted to know how my dentist office was using their putty. And I think I, I definitely had one of the more unique calls of the day for that poor person. Now, the results of this were really interesting. First off, when I looked at just overall shape, how are people moving? What kind of forces are they putting on their bodies? There wasn't any difference between my high weight and my normal weight BMI samples. So there wasn't a distinct difference in how people were moving or how much they were moving that was driving any shape change. But when I looked at the amount of bone that they had, the closer I got to the hip, the more I found that people with higher BMIs had thicker bones, but only close to the hip, not further down towards the center of the bone. There's something going on with the way forces is being translated through the hip that is different in people with higher BMIs. So what I'm able to say from that is that body mass and maybe body composition might have an impact on bone strength, but not shape, and only closer to the hip. Okay, cool, I've answered my question, right? This is it. all I needed to worry about. Well, sadly, it's a lot more complicated than just body mass. There's a lot of things that can influence how forces go through your leg. If you are walking in a very hilly terrain, you get stronger bones. If you have, or males versus females have differences in bone strength. This is also tied into hormone levels. Estrogen is very uh, distinctly sensitizing to bones. So the amount of estrogen you have might be influencing these effects. How your body proportions are set. People with wider pelvis tend to put more force through their hips. Might have to do with the amount of muscle you have as well as your weight. Is there an impact of genetics? What's going on with the kinds of activities that you're doing? What if you're doing a very high impact activity as a very small bodied person? Is that going to make your bones as strong as someone who's got a higher body mass? And then of course, there's also the influences of growth and development. So while my initial thoughts were a really fun starting place, it doesn't completely answer the question of why larger bodied people have this increase in bone thickness at the hip. And then what happens if these factors overlap? What if the amount of muscle you have is caused by the kind of exercise that you do? And then it just starts to get so complicated that you wonder how you're going to pick these things apart. And that's what I'm focusing on right now. There's a data set created by the National Institute of Health that ends up having about 500 Americans with the bone strength, as well as really extensive data on 
their lifestyle and with how they exercise and how much they weigh now versus how much they weighed as teenagers, males and females, uh, differences in their hormone levels. It's incredibly interesting. But it has enough information that I can at least start trying to pick apart all of these different factors and see if some have a higher impact than the other. It also means I'm spending a lot of time making really complicated nightmare charts like this. So what I can say right now, and this is the work I'm still currently uh, focusing on, is that body mass still seems to be the main driving factor in bone strength in the upper, in the upper femur closer to the hip. There is a relationship between mass and lean mass. People who have higher body masses tend to have lower muscle mass, which is something that was not totally clear in the literature. And it really seems that it's a mass relationship. All of these other things have small impacts, but mass has always been the main driving factor, which makes sense with what we know, but watch this space for future, uh, future updates. So what do I really want you to take away from this, this talk? And that's really just the appreciation for your skeleton. It's a dynamic part of your body that's constantly supporting your behavior. No matter what you do, your skeleton is there trying to adapt to these forces. And skeletons are a really valuable resource for learning about the past, particularly about behaviors that we would love to know more about, but just can't observe firsthand. And there's still a lot more to learn about the factors that alter our bones. And that I think is my absolute favorite part. There's still so much that we don't know even about our very bodies. So I do have a lot of people I wanna thank because I get to do this work because I have a lot of wonderful people who are helping me out, um, including my committee and the people at the Texas State University, some collaborators at the University of Missouri, and as well as a very, very tolerant uh, deer processing plant in Missouri and the subjects of the NHANES 3 National Health Survey. And thank you for listening to me today. Um, if you have any questions, I would absolutely love to hear them. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Robin. I like the dancing skeletons um, mm -hmm. at the end. Um, that is fascinating. Yep. Well, and thank you. <laughs> I do, I was wondering, this is probably like another another avenue you like don't want to go down at all but i i know you you might have mentioned it too but just nutrition and how, yes. how nutritional deficiency deficiencies can affect bone density and and things like that so it's like you have all these factors that you need to take into account and Exactly. And that's why things get so complicated. Though nutrition is seeming to play less of a role than we originally thought. Yeah. Um, one yeah. of the things that my advisor actually looked into was the difference between women with anorexia and women who are just naturally of very low body fat and found that the differences in the weak bones that we see in anorexic women just have to do with the fact that they've lost so much weight. It doesn't actually have to do with the fact that they yeah. haven't been eating in a very healthy way. So it really does all seem to come back to body weight, which I think is really cool. I have a yeah, question. Agreed. Go, Rachel. Yes, question. Um, so did you find that with age, I know they didn't live very long back then, but with age, did you find the wearing of bones more or was, did they seem more like they had the thicker bones throughout their whole generational lifespans? Well, I'm lucky with my Texas State sample. Um, most of the work I've been able to do personally has focused on modern populations because they're a lot easier to get a hold of for research. Um, and I can also ask more detailed questions because I already know the answers to the questions. So I can look and see what patterns I'm seeing and try to compare them to documented samples. So then you can extrapolate further back. We do see that people's bones do tend to get a little bit more delicate as they age. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that works in those late Pleistocene samples. The people actually did live a decent age. If you made it past about the age of five, you were probably gonna do okay. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Other questions? You can type them in the chat. Oh, Christine. See. 
Christine says, I exactly. love this topic so much. So the conclusion is that the increased cortical area of the proximal femur is correlated with higher BMI, but the reason is unclear due to all the factors acting on the bone, age, activity, hormones, et cetera. And you're using the database to help narrow down those factors? Exactly, Christine. If that was the two minute version of my talk, you've nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Does anyone else have any more questions for Robin? Oh, Jim says, what does your research tell us about what they did that caused fractures that they did have? Um, so in what time period? Because there's a, a covered quite a few time periods in this talk, James. So um, in modern populations, it usually just means that you've put more force on your bones than they could handle. So in, in uh, those late pl uh, Pleistocene populations, you're probably seeing things like accidents. Neanderthals themselves have a lot of bone fractures, we think, because, you know, they're getting up close and personal with really large, angry cows and ungulates who really don't like being stuck with a spear. So that tends to cause a lot of fractures in the body. But that's probably the biggest factor is just daily life. And we know at least that they had very strong bones based on all of the activity that they did. Uh, e. Schmidt, would a thin person who lifted weights have a bone density or similar strength to a higher BMI person who did not lift weights and exercise? That is exactly the question I'm working on right now. And that's the kind of interesting interplay that hasn't really been explored in depth in a lot of the bone functional adaptation literature. So that's what I'm curious about is how much of it is body mass and how much of it is activity. And it seems like it might be skewing a bit more towards the body mass side of things. And Doug is deep into thin person who lifted weights yet. That's what I'm working on now. Will you know the answers when you get a certain number from the geometry and statistics? Yes, so that super giant crazy chart that I made looks at all of the different factors that I can address and how they affect each other and how then they affect the outcome measurements I'm looking at, all of those measurements of bone bending strength. So I'm looking for significant relationships mathematically and then what those relationships are as far as like, as one goes up, is the other going up with it? Is it an inverse relationship? And is one factor influencing another factor in a way I might not have anticipated? So it's a lot of statistics. I like Christine's response to your answer. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Does anyone else have any more questions? Anyone? Anyone? Thank you, Christine. I think, yeah, I think you and Christine might need to talk after this. I, I really do think so. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else? Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Chris is rubbing her eyes. She's looking sleepy. <laughs> Turn off your video if you don't want me to see. Um, well, Robin, I really appreciate appreciate your giving the giving a talk tonight. Um, and well, thank you all I know so this was just kind me. of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg for for this topic, and I found it very interesting. Yeah, and cool. um, well, we'd like to have you back once you're done with your once you're done with your research and see oh, what you well. can tell us. I would absolutely afterwards. love that. Thank you all so much for having me today. Great job, Robin. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So thanks everybody for being here and um, we'll see you in January. Mm -hmm. Happy Thanksgiving all. Yep. Happy, Happy holidays. So much. <laughs> Bye guys. See all the board members next month. Yep. yep. Uh,
<laughs> Sounds good. Bye. Bye. <laughs>